Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Director of Care Programs at Jewish Funders Network. And on behalf of JFN, I'm happy to welcome you to today's webinar, which is part of a series hosted by the National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty. The National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty is a collective of funders, Jewish federations, direct service providers, researchers, media outlets, and advocates dedicated to fighting poverty in the American Jewish community. In this session, we will dive deeper into innovation and what that can mean in our work. I will now hand it over to um, to our moderator today, Susan Wolf-Dipkoff of the Bridge Brand Group Boston, and she will um, she will help frame the conversation and get us started today. Thank you so much, Susan. Great. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you to JFN and to the National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty um, as part of this webinar series. Um, we are very excited today to uh, talk with three uh, experts in the field of um, engaging people with lived experiences and design thinking um, for innovation in specifically around the area of Jewish poverty. So first we have Giddy Grinstein, who is the founder of um, Tom, and he will tell you what that is, um, and the founder of Rayut Group. Uh, we have Dr. Gary Rant, who is a healthcare professional, an entrepreneur and philanthropist. And we have Roy Goldenberg, um, who is the director of Israel Communities for Tom. So one thing I want to acknowledge at the outset is uh, just sort of about, about the series in general. Um, we do strive for representation in every webinar that we do. This includes gender representation, racial representation, and people who are most impacted by the issues that we're discussing, people with lived experiences. And while this webinar does not include all of those representations, we have had, just so folks know, we are paying attention to the statistics, and we've had a number of all-female webinars in the past, um, Jews of color webinars, webinars in the past and many, many other um, sort of configurations. So we are paying careful attention to those. And what I'm very excited about this webinar for is the focus on people with lived experience and putting them in the center of the process um, of services and products and programs that will benefit them um, as opposed to other ways to engage or not engage them. Um, in solutions that affect them directly. So hopefully today we will get to some of those really, really critical issues because they are not only questions of efficiency and effectiveness as we will hear, but they're also fundamental Jewish values. They're about respect and dignity um, and placing people at the center um, in communal solutions. So with that, um, I will say a couple words about uh, design thinking in the social sector, which is what we're going to talk a lot about today. Um, but there is a history of design thinking um, in business where you take the, the user, the consumer, the customer, and you put them at the center of the design process and you design around them, with and for them in mind. Um, there is also a history for the last decade plus or so of that happening in the in the social sector in the United States, certainly and elsewhere. Um, IDO.org um, has toolkits online, Stanford D School, um, others have focused on this um, in the general nonprofit sector in the US. And then more recently in the last couple of years, there's been much more attention to sort of, you know, ensuring that anti-racism and equity is sort of centered within the design thinking process uh, so that it doesn't uh, replicate um, sort of structural racism and inequity um, unintentionally when it's trying to do the opposite. So that said, there is not a long, deep history of that at work in the Jewish poverty sector um, focused here. And um, the people that we have on the phone call today are thinking very hard about that and have been working on that for many years. And so we're excited to learn with them. Um, so let me start, Gideon, why don't you start off and let us know a little bit about how you think about the question of, of pro problem solving, both kind of at a, at a high level, but then also just some very specific examples for us. Um, and I do want to say that we did try to have a uh, gender representation and the top three people we went to uh, just were not available. So I really apologize uh, for that because we do think about it in our movement. We believe it's a movement that we are designing um, in this process. So I'd like to actually share with you, um, share with the audience a few insights about this whole notion of Jewish poverty and how we began, came to think about it. So first I want to share what is the problem that we saw. And when I say we, I'm talking about an Israeli group called Reut, based in Israel, dealing with policy and strategy, not with specific solutions for people living with disabilities, elderly or poor. And what we saw from the policy and the strategy level 
um, we saw that in the quest to create an inclusive society, there are some sectors that are structurally disenfranchised. They're structurally excluded from the business world, from creating affordable business solutions to their needs, but also from creating, uh, from receiving relevant government response to their needs. So basically they were living at this intersection of market and government shortcomings. I'm hesitant to say failures because it's not a market failure in, in the typical sense of the word. So we're looking at all these groups who have who are niche situations, who are who are small in number. They have a, a, a problem, a, a human condition that needs a, a customization. Um, they're poor. They don't have political influence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And all these groups, when you add them up, it's actually a lot of people and many, many needs. And the reason I distinguish that is that when in situations where we're dealing with severe needs. Actually, one individual that is often counted as one person for the statistics could have dozens and dozens of needs. So the needs are much greater than the number of people that are actually we're actually working with. In any case, the second phenomenon we're looking at is what we call the change in the nature of change, which means the accelerating pace of change in society, the growing number of disruptions that is leaving many more people who are unable to adjust and therefore they're left by the wayside. So uh, in some ways, we, we, uh, we, we, we're asking ourselves, how can we address these people? And then we saw another observation, which is there are many initiatives that give a specific solution to a specific problem. But we were looking at a systemic problem and we wanted to give a systemic solution to that. And the last key observation Two, the two last observations I'd like to share with you in these opening remarks is that we were keenly aware of the difference between technical innovation, which is often referred to as technological innovation. That means your new watch, your new car, your new computer, et cetera, et cetera, uh, algorithms, uh, designs in engineering, et cetera, and societal innovation, which is how you organize people to get things done. So the first venture capital firm, the first standing army, the first bank, they were not innovations in technology, they were innovations in structure. And we understood that this, there is this very, very sophisticated and, and delicate balance between technical innovation and societal innovation. And that a lot of people are focused on technical innovation where in order to deal with the challenges that we are looking at, we needed societal innovation. We need new ways, needed new ways of organizing people. The last thing I did, I'll say is that we also saw that there is tremendous abundance right next to the scarcity that we're looking at. So we saw people who need special solutions for let's say as a prosthesis. And then two kilometers from there or two miles from there, there's a university with engineering students who are doing projects anyhow, and they have these amazing facilities, yet the abundance that existed in that university did not meet the need of people who lived very close by. And we saw that existence of abundance and scarcity everywhere. So we wanted to, uh, so we're asking ourselves, how is it that the abundance doesn't flow to the scarcity, to meet the scarcity? And we realized that there are a lot of barriers, a lot of of hurdles that have to be uh, worked for this for these um, forces to meet the force of uh, abundance to meet the needs of scarcity. So that's where, in our case, design thinking came into being. So obviously, there is, as Susan said, there's design thinking around products, around processes. But in our case, we wanted to design a platform that will allow this abundance of of resources, of goodwill, of talent. Uh, of engineers who are willing to donate their time, of universities who have excessive uh, excess capacity in their uh, facilities, et cetera, et cetera. We want to build a platform that will allow that abundance to deal with the, with the scarcity. And then we realized that the problem we were looking at in Israel is actually a global problem. So if you can solve one, solve all. And that was really the big idea behind our work, and which led us to then understand that we could really moonshoot 
in this case and aim to help 250, that was our goal, 250 million people uh, within a decade as a partnership between Israel and the Jewish world. And I can explain that uh, maybe later, we, we can get to that. But essentially our idea was let's uh, create a process that will allow many, many, many uh, pockets of abundance to deal with the many pockets of scarcity. That was our that was the platform that we came to uh, to de- that we came to design. Fantastic! Thank you so much. That was a great framing of the issue um, and sort of where your where your theory meets and, and informs the practice uh, and the design of the of the work. Um, Gary, if I can turn to you, um, one thing that um, folks should know about Gary is that he has a a degree, a master's degree in behavioral science, which is so fascinating to me on many levels. And we've talked about that in other webinars. So just, Gary, if you can sort of talk to us a little bit about how you think about philanthropy, how you think about um, sort of this approach um, and this sort of platform and, and the power and the potential of it um, and get us started. Good, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks, thank you to the Jewish Funders Network for inviting me and uh, in particular to Giddy who I admire greatly for all he's done, uh, for his incredible analysis of uh, the world today and how we as Jews can help improve it. Um, My interests philanthropically are really in three buckets, education and educational reform, healthcare reform and political activism, um, to name a few. Um, The commonality, I would say, that they have and the lens through which I tend to look at things is how to change behavior, which is where I was most fortunate to to have done a a degree, um, a master's in behavior change, which I did. And funnily enough, um, I'm actually a periodontist, a dentist by profession. And uh, the reason that I did my master's was I couldn't understand why after having gone through major treatment, periodontal surgery, oral rehabilitation, people still hadn't got the message of how to keep their mouths clean. And so the degree in, behavior, in, in changing behavior made a huge difference to my whole practicing career of 50 years. I've just recently retired from a clinical practice. But behavior change encapsulated not only individual change from one clinician to a patient, but group-based behavior change and the effects that you can have with uh, socio-behavioral determinants of changing behavior. And also, as one of my mentors once said to me, if you want to make change in dentistry, you have to do it through public policy change. So being active in the political arena has made a huge amount of difference in in ultimately changing uh, people's behavior. Design thinking is a a specific mode that has become very important. And uh, as we get into this talk, I can cite three examples where we have used design thinking, one of which specifically have hired uh, a design thinking um, firm to change the culture on on one particular campus in the United States. Uh, Given the stress academic pressure, drug use, and suicides across the nation uh, with bad behaviors starting in grade school and high school and going all the way through to college, we decided to take this up as a challenge. And that's one of the things that my wife and I have done. And I can talk more about those uh, issues uh, later. The the other um, approach we've used sort of design thinking is to uh, change uh, global oral health. We've just started a center at University of Pennsylvania uh, for that. The title is actually Integrative Global Oral Health because we need to integrate with medicine because we we share so many of the causes of non-communicable disease with physicians that don't get talked about. The other sadness is we've known for over 50 years how to completely prevent dental disease, but we don't use what we know in a systematic way to democratize uh, healthcare. And that gets me back to uh, Giddy and our support for Tom. We have felt that it's, uh, with his approach, it's fundamentally important to democratize help and to do it from the bottom up rather than the top down. Uh, 
And I really think that his approach epitomizes that. So thank you. Good, That's, this is fantastic. It's good to hear both the philosophy, some concrete examples, and then just how it gets incorporated, broadly speaking, in different kinds of philanthropic initiatives um, and what the, what the power and the potential is. So I'm, I'm sure we'll get into all of that. Um, this is a terrific opening. Uh, so Roy, Roy Goldenberg is the Director of Israel Communities for Tikkun Olam Makers. Um, we've been referring to Tom. Um, so Roy is an engineer and he's going to tell us how his experience um, working as an engineer in other other kinds of design systems, but then this design system has been very different. Um, he was also a Tom Fellow um, and has just wonderful stories to tell us about engaging people with lived experience um, in the center of the design process. So Roy, um, kick us off. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank uh, JFM for inviting me here today. It's uh, really such an honor speaking with uh, the people here on the call. Um, so um, my uh, journey with Tom uh, started uh, around four years ago. I was, uh, my background is in polymer engineering. So it's a bit different from uh, maybe the, my, my friends here on the call. Um, and uh, I was always very passionate for technology. Um, and during my second year of school, um, I saw something uh, on campus that, you know, for me was very frustrating because I saw all the, my friends, the students from the design and the engineering uh, campuses um, at the end of every semester, you know, handing their final projects and, you know, in, in the good scenario, it was, you know, uh, maybe they would put it on the shelf at home. Most cases, it will be thrown to the garbage can outside the campus. And I was looking at this and just, you know, was very frustrated to see how much energy was spent, you, you know, was put in this, you know, system and just been thrown away and just useless uh, the moment after the, um, the exhibition. And uh, at the same time, uh, I met Tom and uh, I had the opportunity um, to volunteer in one of the, uh, one of Tom's Makeathon, which is one of our uh, events. Um, and I had this opportunity because uh, uh, one of the projects was uh, uh, to design for a good friend of mine from who served with me in the army and he was injured uh, during protective edge operation uh, to, uh, to design for him uh, kind of a protective gear uh, for snowboarding. Uh, he was injured in his elbow from, uh, from a bullet and uh, he wanted to go back snowboarding. And uh, for me, it was a really you know, nice opportunity to um, to come be with him uh, there, but uh, I did not expect um, the experience uh, that I got there. Um, so I was volunteering my whole life, uh, working with uh, uh, people with disabilities, working, uh, you know, um, um, doing all these kind of uh, volunteering uh, um, um, actions. But um, at that place, all of a sudden something clicked because I saw how I can take my super let's say superpowers, uh, but like really my top skills and not just to donate my time, but really donate something that is way more precious and way more satisfying as well. And to really change the life of someone who was also very close to me. Um, and uh, from that moment, you know, this is where my journey with Tom started. And uh, I'm, I've been with Tom for the last uh, four years. And I think that for people like me who are passionate around technology, um, it is a very, very unique platform to uh, give back to society. It may be even the most unique platform. Excellent. So um, thank you for that. Um, before we kind of get into the next part of the discussion, I want to encourage anyone who has questions um, to type them into the chat or into the Q&A, and we will work them into the conversation. Uh, so the chat is open. Um, Right, if we can just come back to something that you said, I think, you know, one of the things that I hear very often is that it's very hard uh, to take people with disabilities or people who are living in poverty um, and put them in the center of the design process because they're not engineers. They, they don't know how, how to build things. And so um, you really need professionals and experts in the center of the process. And I mean, from my own perspective, you know, I'm, I don't know how to make my iPhone do anything except turn on. Um, and yet uh, people manage to ask me questions about what I want to be able to do with my iPhone. And I can tell them I want to do this. I don't want to do that. 
if you said these features, not those features, um, I don't care about that other thing. And I don't need to be a software engineer to be a knowledgeable and important part of the, you know, consumers are an important part of the design process. So I guess just a couple of questions for you as you think about engineering, um, particularly focused on people with disabilities or people who are living in poverty. Just talk to us a little bit about sort of how that, how you've seen that play out. I know you've been part of many of these different design processes and maybe just explain, you know, if we went into one of these um, 72 hour sessions or however long it is, tell us what it would look like and, and how, how to center people um, with lived experiences. Sure. So um, I think what um, uh, what what is happening now in most universities, at least the those that I work with, uh, is the uh, is that universities are really are really pushing students into creativity. This is something that is now really an engine for universities to recruit students and uh, educate. This is how they're educating students, but. What happens with the when you are when you need to do a project is that um, you are forced to get it uh, to get a, a creative one, uh, but at the end you are putting yourself in the center of the design process and you ask yourself always what would I need that I don't have. The problem is that most of the things that we need already exist, um, and what happens is that most times uh, a lot of students are designing things that are not really needed because most of the things that you really need already exist. And I think that what's special in our methodology is that the person that we are bringing to the center of the design process is not yourself, but someone with a crucial and a real need that doesn't have this solution because it doesn't have market viability and et cetera, and et cetera. And then um, you can really have the opportunity to do something that is very creative, but also very necessary. And I think this is what really make it special for a lot of uh, uh, people like me who are you know, passionate around technology that you're doing some project, not just for the grade that you get at the end of the year, but also for someone that you, know, you ha really have the opportunity to change his life. So I think this is what's really special around the, um, uh, our methodology. And I think it also has a rollover effect because um, I met many people that we work with, uh, people with disabilities, um, that ended up, you know, the process with us and then decided to uh, change their life, going to study something in the world of technology, design and, or engineering. I saw many people uh, from uh, the technology side that decided to do something and work for uh, uh, assistive technology companies and startups uh, or the, uh, the medical device startups. So it really has a rollover effect that, you know, it's keep growing and growing. So. And I think uh, this is what I love most about the, the way we see uh, the design processes. That's great. And Giddy, maybe Giddy, maybe you can give us an example of if we were to spend time on one of these, maybe just give one example, like what would it look like? What does the beginning look like? What does the middle look like? Just walk us through how it actually happens. Right. I just want to start by uh, sharing an observation that probably everybody on this call would appreciate. It's very expensive to be poor. Everything costs more on relative scale. Um, so if someone is living with disability, they need a special arrangement, their house, building their house costs more, uh, fitting their clothes costs more, the prosthesis and all the devices, everything costs more. So it's not just that there's poverty, there is uh, in the sense, so poverty here is not just in the fact that there is low income, it's also a lot of times that their expenses are high. Okay, so I just want to uh, highlight that a about, I would say, 20 to 30% of our innovations at the innovation in Tom, and today we're working on nearly 600 projects in parallel. So 20 to 30% are inventions, never existed before. But the other 70, 80% are innovations around affordability or accessibility, meaning taking a complicated solution and making it simple, or taking an expensive solution and making it affordable. And in our model, we believe that we can bring down the cost of product to the user by 80 to 99%, okay? 99% cheaper than the available market alternative. It's in the cards of what we're doing. So I can explain how it works in the unit economics, but just to explain the process, okay? Comes a guy, um, he's a wounded vet from Israel. This is just a, a project got a lot of fame. It was in CNN and in New York Times, et cetera. So that's why I'm, circling back, some people may have seen it. 
So comes a wounded, an Israeli wounded vet. He has a $50,000 prosthesis from the Ministry of Defense. But there are three problems. Number one, that he brings to us. Number one, he wants to cook and he can't cook without prosthesis. He wants to paint and he cannot do that. And he wants to sit to a dinner table with a fork and a knife. And he can't do all of that with this $15,000 prosthesis. So a team of engineers, programmers, product designers in Israel work with him, create a $120 solution that is open source, which means the intellectual property is deposited in the public domain. That now means that anybody anywhere around the world can either improve the product or use the product. A few months later, our community in Singapore comes forward with a guy, his name is Boone, lost arms and legs to a flesh eating bacteria. He wants to be able to go to the toilet independently. Now, the issue is moving from a single hand amputee to double hand amputee is very complicated because there's no other hand to put the prosthesis on, right? So you need to be able to put the prosthesis with the stump and so on. Anyhow, the Israeli team emails to Singapore the design of the product and the Singapore team, which is made up of local Singaporeans organized by the way by Israelis who live in Singapore, they build this prosthesis. You can find it all on our website. And then a few months later comes a girl in Israel and she wants to be able, she doesn't have a left hand and she wants to be able to play the violin. Now, if you Google prosthesis for playing violin, $30,000, that's what you'll find. So uh, um, um, our team takes the design that was created for Boone, takes the design that was created for Noam, adjusts the designs, tweaks it and makes it so that she can play the violin without an arm for the cost of between 100 and 150 dollars. Okay, so we, we've taken something that would have been for a family. She comes from an ultra orthodox family. Uh, for most families, who could afford thirty thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars on a prosthesis where it's not covered by insurance? Okay, so now she can do that. Now all these designs you can find them. They're very like IKEA style. We shamelessly looked at IKEA and did whatever we can to make something inspired by IKEA. By, but uh, um, you can see all that. You can see exactly how to build this. And technically today, anywhere around the world, people can build what, these three prostheses. So one is for going to the toilet, one is for painting, one is for cooking, holding a fork and knife and playing the violin. And also, by the way, drumming, playing the drums. Okay, so this is uh, an example. Now, we believe that you, could, you can create a library of 1,000 to 2,500 solutions like that, not just for people with disabilities, because when you put at the center of the design process, poor people, just before COVID, we were talking about having a, a Tom team in New York focused on project, taking a, like one of these big po projects, pockets of poverty, and just focusing on needs of people there. Because it, the, the issue here is not whether the need comes from someone with disability, someone elderly or someone uh, poor. All of them are economically challenged in many cases. It's about the process in which you allow the top talent that exists right next door. In the case of New York, Harlem and Columbia University in the same geographic space and just allow the, the abundance to meet the scarcity, the talent that exists in, in Columbia University to meet the problems that exist in Harlem. That's what we're trying to do. And of course, I'm giving American examples, but this is in a project came out of Israel, growing in Israel, et cetera, et cetera. Good, and those specifics are so helpful because I think that in other webinars, and, and Gary, you might have opinions on this, but in other webinars, especially when thinking about a philanthropic perspective, um, it's people are increasingly recognizing, in the philanthropic world, increasingly recognizing the importance Again, not just from a dignity perspective and a values perspective of bringing people who are most affected by the problem into the center of the decision making process, um, but even as people are starting to talk more about that, how to do it still seems a little bit elusive. Um, traditional grant making process, traditional process of identifying grantees. Identi you know, surveying people with needs and then trying to build something that fits them and you roll it out and maybe it doesn't fit them. But this is really sort of flipping that whole, you know, research and development process on its head by bringing people who are, you know, again, into the into the center of the process saying, this is what, what I need, now let's build for that, as opposed to trying to take a program and, and roll it out. And it takes a tremendous amount of not only skill, as we've talked about, but 
there's sort of a lot of humility and a lot of, um, you know, sort of a lot of rapid prototyping involved and, and testing and learning and, and sort of acknowledgement of some of the, the, the constructs and the systems that, that set this up in the first place. So I'm curious, as you all have sort of thought about the applicability of this broadly, um, we, even in situations where perhaps the exact process isn't going to be followed, but sort of to other types of investments. And, and again, Gary, you started down this road. How do you think about the potential of this kind of thinking to really sort of influence or revolutionize many areas of focusing on poverty? Like what, what, what is that potential? What could it look like? It's a very interesting question, and I am still a student of philanthropy and approaches to philanthropy. One of the interesting things uh, during the pandemic is how uh, private uh, foundations have come together with the public sector to find solutions, whether it be vaccinations, distribution of vaccinations, uh, etc. I think the private philanthropic world is also looking uh, at social impact investing. Uh, one example of this is a book I'm reading now called Making Money Moral uh, by Judith Rodin. I'm not sure if you uh, are familiar with that, but it, it it's, uh, makes very, very interesting thinking. The other thing is we know a lot about the right thing to do, but not many people come up with vehicles to accomplish that. And I think that's one of the most fascinating things about what Giddy has accomplished uh, with Tom. I've used that similar approach with a, with a project that I just mentioned to you. Um, and if you again look at health and you look at what happened in the United States during the pandemic, there were two failures. There was a failure of the health system and there was a failure of leadership. And uh, when you look at how health delivery occurs largely um, in the Western democracies in the United States, it's all treatment based. It's, it's a downstream approach to uh, fixing things once problems have already occurred. The people who can afford dental care, for example, <clears throat> or advanced medical care in the United States are largely higher middle income and upper income people. Lower income people can't access the system, even if they have insurance. So while the debate has been to get everybody insurance, it's not been focused on getting care and reducing costs of care. As I said, in, in dentistry, we have known for over 50 years almost how to completely prevent dental disease, decay, gum disease, and oral cancers. And what we share in common with the medical community is how to treat uh, non-communicable disease. The causes are the same. Hygiene, diet, uh, tobacco use, alcohol use, um, if we can control those through a public policy framework, an upstream approach, clean water, um, fluoridation, we can reduce the costs of care and keep people healthy. And, and so that's why uh, using this sort of similar approach to Giddy, a design thinking approach, and how to accomplish it, we can do, th we can do a lot. Good. Roy, Giddy, anything else on, on this idea as you as you think about kind of the broader applicability of this kind of thinking? And I should again say the chat is open if people want to put questions or thoughts uh, for the for the panelists in the chat. Um, if I may just say that uh, the human centric design, uh, working with what who we call we call them need knowers. These are people who know the needs. It's not just ethical in the sense that people uh, you know, doing good, if nobody receives that good or trying to do good or making contribution, if nobody receives that contribution, the other side is meaningless. Um, but I'm just putting that aside. It's also super efficient because the, our philosophy is that the need knowers, the people with the need are integrated into the design team. It's not, you know, it's not like two, units working opposite each other. They are together in the design team. What we call a Tom team includes the need nor in the team. That gives us A, certainty about the need. B, it gives us immediate feedback on all these ideas that are coming out from the engineers and the programmers and so on, who are often, you know, off. You know, it may be a brilliant idea technologically, but totally impractical. We get that feedback very, very quickly so that we can accelerate the process 
of innovation. And when we put everybody in certain ecosystem that uh, we call a makeathon, it's a marathon of three days of accelerated innovation, intense accelerated innovation. We've done more than a hundred of those in 30 countries over the last five years. Um, so what comes up is a process that is beating all other equivalents, even in the business sector. There was actually an NYU study that followed 13 Tom teams uh, in different, in uh, I think two or three makeathons, and the researchers, a professor from NYU, said that what we're doing is superior in its outcome to anything she had seen anywhere else. She actually coined a concept, a management concept around what she saw happening with us. And the beauty, the power is the integration of the need knower into the design team, very quick feedbacks, and kind of loose guidelines on how to drive the innovation so that the teams can actually innovate in terms of the process. They know that they get to get they need to get to a working prototype. We don't tell them exactly how to get there. So the fact that they can do that is uh, together with the need knower in integrated into the team is, is, is really phenomenal. And the other thing that is very important to understand is that a lot of these constituencies, uh, vulnerable constituencies that have special needs, as I said, it's not only that they fall short on the income, they also pay a very high price, relatively speaking, to what they need. We are in a world today where we can dramatically decrease the cost of the, un the unit price if we can crowdsource the innovation, so there's no cost for innovation, if the, the IP is public domain, so there's no cost of IP, if we manufacture locally, so there is no uh, uh, logistics, there's no distribution, there's no cost of inventory. And obviously, since we're a nonprofit, it's a nonprofit work, right? So you take out six elements in the, in the unit price, and that's how you can get to 80 to 99% cost decrease, same functionality for the users. And that's dramatic because it suddenly, it not only allows the same people using the product to pay less, it, it brings many more people into the market that otherwise would not even fathom having a prosthesis for their kid to play the violin. It's not even in the cards. And suddenly it is. Fantastic. So tell us a little bit about one of these three day sessions. What happens on, and if there's one focused on poverty, we've talked a lot about disabilities, which is terrific and is an important piece of the, the National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty for all the reasons you just mentioned. Are there other ones? Um, and just talk us through what those three days, what happens before day one? What happens on day one? Um, what happens on day two? How does it, how does it work? How does it well, feel? That's where you do that. They just did one in Israel. I'll just say that we are focused on disabilities as the pilot. We want to prove concept. The proof of concept is that you can actually uh, mass innovate, mass customize, and mass deliver products at radically affordable prices. This is the experiment that we're involved with. We're proving it on the vertical of people with disabilities. But uh, Susan, in the prep <clears throat> call, I told you uh, the right before COVID, we were in discussions, uh, I mentioned this earlier, to having Tom teams focused on one project, you know, when I came to New York, I didn't understand that a project is actually thousands of families living in, in, in these vertical poverty uh, um, neighborhoods. Um, so to have a TOM team collaborating with Mount Sinai uh, Innovation Unit, collaborating with our TOM team community in, in Columbia University, just focused on needs that are coming from the, this project. That would have been a very important experiment for us because we would have been able to test the model on a new vertical. It was disrupted by COVID, by, by COVID unfortunately, but it will happen. Guaranteed it will happen. At some point it's coming back. Anyhow, absolutely. And here. absolutely. And we've talked so much about how people with disabilities are, as you said, the cost of everything is higher and just the vulnerability and that intersection between people with disabilities and their families and poverty, it just is, is extraordinary. So yes, Roy, please Product, tell us. Products are unnecessarily complicated. We have, we have products where our team just took a complicated product and made it simple. So instead of having hinges that you can only buy in a special store and they get whatever imported from some other country, you now have a product that uses a single piece of wood, uh, regular screws, 
and a lot of the, all the connectors are 3D printed. So it can now be manufactured in almost any high school in a developed country. So, so you know, so a lot of a lot of innovation is 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 not inventions, just making things simple and affordable. Anyhow, we. Yeah, so actually what we did just last week was uh, kind of an, an experiment uh, that I believe was very successful in um, how we think about human centered design. So what we usually used to do is, uh, you know, th getting a space and then bring on one side uh, the makers who are, you know, the people with the technological capabilities and then bring from the other side the mid knowers and get the teams and uh, create the innovation process. So what we did now is that the space that we used was a rehabilitation center. So we did we brought the innovation process to the heart of the need. Uh, so we were working in a rehabilitation center called Adi Negev in the uh, in, uh, it's right next to the Ofakim and Be'er Sheva in the south of Israel. Um, we created uh, we worked on five projects. So we had five teams of students from Ben Gurion universities, engineers from Teva Pharmaceutical and automotive industries in Israel. Uh, and we brought all of them together, uh, put them in teams, and each one of them was working with a single need knower. Um, and uh, they, we have, usually we have a pre make which is a day where everyone meet and they start ideate. So this is also circles back to uh, um, design thinking. Uh, so they ideate within, you know, this month and a half, creating the concepts, and then they come for the uh, three days to a marathon of uh, uh, making. Um, I think one of, uh, I'll share with you one of the stories because I think it's a really interesting one. So we worked with uh, Rabbi Yosef. Uh, he's 75, I think, years old. Uh, and he had a stroke uh, and now uh, he suffered from, um, you know, he's paralyzed on uh, one side of the body. And he came to us because he really dreamed of you know putting to the, the filling uh putting on the filling every morning by himself because now he needs someone to help him to put the filling and it's uh, this kind of very individual experience that uh, people uh, wants to uh, have every day uh and he wanted to have a solution how he can put the filling by himself and uh, you know say the prayers uh so we put the team around him and they worked on creating a, a kind of this um a device with a roller that spins around and uh, placed the filling on his hand uh and um you know he was so excited you know seeing him at the end of the uh, event you know just for him seeing even during the event seeing how he he is experiencing people other people younger people they were like 20 something years old uh, his team members working uh with him just to help him to do this every day Thing that is so important to him was you know this is truly this is why i wake up every morning and go to work so it, it was for me very uh emotional and um you know it's it's something that is very very unique gary yeah please yeah i i want to um, um perhaps address uh something that i think is very important and probably applicable to uh the jewish funders network Number one is uh, investing in innovation, seed money, venture capital, and number two, the politics of change. Um, most of uh, the, the Tikkun Olam makers projects are university based. And sometimes it takes politics to get the hierarchy to accept innovation particularly when they're used to a certain way of thinking, uh, and most universities tend to be quite conservative. And I wonder if it's uh, a good idea to address that a little bit, especially uh, given uh, this audience. That'd be fantastic, please. Well, I can start with um, the, the Tel Aviv University story. Um, we had one round where we approached uh, the um, hierarchy, a, 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 several years ago and they had I wouldn't say they weren't interested but they had different priorities it then really took me to go back to the next um, uh, wave of uh, leaders and represent it and uh, re really represented it in a way uh, to a lot of the major funders of the university to say this is a project that can't lose and then I seed funded it myself 
And um, now um, we have an extraordinary person on Tel Aviv University campus, and it's really taking off because we allowed the opportunity or we created the opportunity to show that the project can really make a difference. And I hope as it grows, it will further democratize the way the university thinks, which I think is really critically important uh, related to uh, other issues, and many of which we're facing today. And I would submit including democracy and including anti-Semitism across the world. Uh, so I, I couldn't agree more. And in a minute, we're, um, we're almost at the top of the hour. So I'll, I'll let each of the three of you have sort of a, a parting comment or a parting thought. Um, but it just strikes me, Gary, that what you just said really prevents um, some of the most difficult or, um, or problematic parts um, or can help prevent them, the most difficult or problematic parts of philanthropy. Um, a number of years ago, I was working with a philanthropist who was very good hearted um, and, uh, and really wanted to make a difference in a community living in poverty. Um, and this person's life uh, was really formed by, uh, by sports. This, this individual's you know, made their um, fortune um, as a result of their leadership skills and they felt that those came from their sports. Uh, experiences and they really wanted to create um, a sports facility and an outstanding sports facility for this community, um, which was great, uh, except when they engaged the community, what the community really wanted was uh, affordable childcare, affordable, high quality childcare so that people could go to work. Um, that was something that they didn't have. Um, and to make a very long story short, um, the, this was sort of a, a, sort of fast forward a little bit later, I wasn't involved in this part, but um, essentially the donor decided to build the sports, the sports facility because that's what was meaningful to that person and that's what um, that's what they wanted to do. And I think what's, what's important about that story is that the community had a voice, but it wasn't centered. And that, and that voice wasn't helping to inform decisions about what they thought would be best and most important um, in their community uh, to help meet their needs. Um, and they weren't treated as need knowers. They weren't treated as experts in their own life. Um, and you know, the, it was a beautiful facility, but it really did not move the needle in the way I think the donor had had intended it to. And so some of the things that we've been talking about here just feel like really important sort of structures and not only structures, but sort of mental approaches, mental models um, and approaches that can help avoid something like that. And Giddy, you were talking about efficiency and effectiveness. And I think Gary, you were talking about some of the, the policies and the structural barriers. Um, so it's just, this is, I think there's just a lot of potential here. Just as parting thoughts, I mean, Today we're, we're here, we, we gather together to speak about Jewish poverty. And uh, there is a question, what's Jewish about poverty? Because a, a hungry person is a hungry person. A person who cannot pay for the kid's education is a universal problem. It's not just a Jewish problem. Obviously, if someone needs kosher food and they can't afford kosher food, that's a very, very specifically Jewish aspect of the problem. Or, uh, and so on. But generally speaking, there is something universal about poverty. I will say that what's Jewish about poverty, in my view, is the way our community responds to poverty. Um, and in some ways, I think we have a, un a unique approach to making sure that people are not left behind. Um, I would probably, I would not be surprised if there will be a research that will show that poor people are poor but Jewish poor are less isolated. And they, they have a higher chance of someone reaching out and so on. So I think, I think that in this respect, there is a Jewishness, a Jewish aspect to the poverty. But I wanna speak about a, a different thing that is happening right now, which I think is super exciting. And that is that today, first of all, from the, in the big picture, I believe that today the Jewish world has transitioned into a new era in Jewish history because for millennia, the contribution of the, of the Jews to the world was qualitative through our values, our institutions, our laws, the patterns of our communities and so on. It was leadership by example. We, we were, for example, the first to introduce universal education. Today, it's sort of the norm. And, uh, and so on and so forth. So, um, but the leadership was qualitative. In the last 10, 20, 30 years, maybe, 
we can also make a quantitative contribution to humanity by improving the lives of hundreds of millions of people. And that magic is happening because we have uh, Israel is an amazing playground. We have the power and the potential of technology. We have the World Wide Web of Jewish communities that are the most amazing uh, distribution network in the world today that I can think of. And we have this army of people who are motivated by this ideal of tikkun olam and, and uh, being enlightened to the nations in their communities and their societies. And they're willing to take action and devote resources and time and money and energy and et cetera, et cetera. So these four things have put the Jewish people, I think, in a new phase in our history in this respect, in the, in the relating to our contribution to humanity. So this was sort of maybe a, you would find it a long-winded way to say the following. I believe that American poverty today is a huge opportunity, if you could call it that way, to American Jewry. Because the, the, the societal crisis in America is deep and getting deeper. More and more people are disenfranchised, rural communities, et cetera, et cetera. We've heard about the, we, we hear about it all the time. But I think that American Jewry, through uh, its connection with Israel, by working with technology, using its superpower, the superpower of American Jewry, which is the national spread, 50 states, et cetera, et cetera, with this army of people who are inspired by tikkun olam, American Jewry can move the needle for American society. In the, in the unique way in which American Jewry can help America deal with poverty. Mm. And that I think, is where the opportunity lies today. Ah, oh, beautiful. Your enthusiasm is infectious, Giddy. Um, Gary, uh, tell us sort of parting thoughts as you reflect on this conversation. Um, and then, and then, Rui. I completely concur with Giddy and thank him and thank Roy for, uh, and I'm uh, delighted to have shared the panel. The problems are massive, the solutions are relatively simple. And it's not just an American problem of, of Jewish poverty or American poverty. There are world issues to solve now. Climate change, water, uh, sanitation uh, that can bring the world health and it's all education related. So, so, so we need to use global approaches to solve these problems uh, as well as local, but all things start locally. Good. Thank you. And Rui, tell us, as you think about the potential of this from the people on the ground who are designing these solutions um, and working with people who with lived experience every day, tell us if you could kind of leave us with one, one parting idea, uh, what would you say? So <clears throat> I think for uh, people like me uh, who are, again, passionate around technology, I think it's a very unique era where uh, on one hand, you know, we're very much, you know, um, um, aroused uh, by technology, like everywhere we go, you know, I grew up, I, I was born in the 90s. So I saw some early 90s. So I saw this kind of shifting in technology uh, in the last uh, uh, three decades. And what is, what is, I think, very uh, different now, uh, especially working with Tom and uh, working with the World uh, Jury Network, is that how quickly your creative ideas is um, um, spreading uh, because information and, and ideas are really, you know, spreading so quickly uh, around the world. And, um, you know, when I was a kid, I remember, you know, working with my dad uh, in, the, uh, in the backyard, building this, uh, you know, building stuff and uh, most of this assembling stuff, that's, that was uh, how I was, learning how things work, you disassemble stuff. Um, uh, but when we were assembling stuff, so those stuff were, you know, creating in the backyard and we're stayed in the backyard. And today I can do that, you know, take a photo, put it on Facebook, put it somewhere. And then, you know, if it's, if it's good, so, you know, millions of people can see that. So this idea for me, it's really, you know, striking. And I think that, you know, I have really two amazing platforms to share my uh, passion and creativity. The one is Tom, and the second is the, the, this global network of communities um, and of the Jewish people. And uh, for me, it's just 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really thankful to be living in this uh, era of time and uh, to take part in this, you know, redesign of the world that we live in. Absolutely. And I think that's, that's such a beautiful note to end on because everything we see around us was, was built um, with the exception of trees and people, uh, but, but all of the structures, the systems, the institutions, the programs, um, it was all built, um, which is good because it means it can be rebuilt. It means it can be right. dismantled and taken apart and reconfigured by talented engineers, by passionate entrepreneurs, by, uh, by very, very passionate and dedicated philanthropists. Um, and rebuilt in a completely different way, reassembled. Um, and I think that the notion of the world around us being more like Legos than, you know, than uh, fixed, completely fixed, uh, is, is so important. And being able to bring the people who have these lived experiences right into the center of that process so that they can control um, the resources uh, that, that will benefit them, I think is just so, so important. And this thinking, um, in, in my personal opinion, uh, it just needs to be uh, much more pervasive. So thank you. Thank you to each of you for the work you're doing, um, for the example, um, and can't wait to see what's next post-pandemic. So Tamar, back to you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Susan, for moderating. So a master for me, like always, is saying thank you, Gideon, Gary, and Roy, for sharing your story and your enthusiasm with us today. Um, I really think, uh, not that I, think, I know that everybody that was on the line really um, can, can see that passion and can learn a lot from this, from this example that you all live every day. So thank you again, and thank you for everybody that participated. And we look forward to coming again, uh, back together again to learn, to learn soon. So be well, everybody, and, and have a great day. Thank you.